Sport Development Officer with Leicestershire and Rutland Sport. And I'm here with my colleague, Luke Green, our Workforce Development Lead. This year, we've had to run with a very different format, but we are pleased to have been able to host 14 virtual and pre-recorded workshops throughout the past month. The title for our conference has been Building Resilience Together supporting mental wellness, utilizing sport and physical activity. We feel that it's important to support the communities of Leicestershire, Leicester and Rutland to look after their well-being, And we feel that physical activity and sport can play a huge part in helping them to do so. During the current pandemic, the importance of physical activity to support people's well-being has been reiterated by government with us all being encouraged, where possible, to ensure we continue to lead an active life. In addition, there's lots of national evidence that physical activity and sport can have a positive impact on people's mental wellness. In fact, exercise is often described as a wonder drug in preventing and managing mental health. Our hope for this conference was to raise the awareness of physical activity, sport and the links to mental wellness and encourage our networks to champion this agenda. It has been an opportunity for you to build your networks as well as sharing your expertise and experience with each other. Which brings me on to this, our last session of the conference series in which our aim is to enable yourselves to have the opportunity to share good practice discuss opportunities and to network and forge new partnerships. The overall aim following this conference is that we find the best way in which to develop a stronger working relationship with our mental health organisations and practitioners and with our physical activity partners. There are already lots of cases of good practice taking place and it would be beneficial to be able to share experiences and challenges to enable us to work together more closely with the ultimate benefit of creating opportunities for people to benefit from physical activity. Before we go any further though, I would like to recap on the last few weeks. We've gained a great insight into the work of MIND who kicked off the conference with a look at their work from a national perspective and how they have used physical activity as an intervention in their Get Set To Go programme. And we saw through their evaluation of this programme, how physical activity had greatly benefited those individuals involved. And I'm happy to say that we have colleagues from Mind with us today. We also heard from Debbie, who also joins us today. Debbie very kindly shared her mental health challenges with us and explained how she got involved in physical activity and how it really helped her. She's definitely a great advocate of physical activity and definitely a great role model for others. We then had a look at how Mind have worked with partners such as Sport England and UK Coaching to develop and embed physical activity at a regional level and ensure that the tools are in place to support our workforce with awareness of mental health and enable them to feel more confident and comfortable in their delivery. The offer of their e-learning module has been accessed by 845 people in Leicestershire alone. And clearly this shows the commitment that those working in our sectors have towards ensuring they are providing the best environment possible to enable those who may have challenges in accessing physical activity to do so. The regional networks formed through MIND have enabled active partnerships to be part of a wider network, enabling them to be better informed of current initiatives, good practice and general, general awareness of work being undertaken and partners involved and has certainly supported us as officers. Following this, we heard from various organisations such as Age UK and learned more about the work they are doing to help combat loneliness and isolation. It was great to hear directly from those involved in befriending programmes and how this has positively impacted their day-to-day -day lives, but also to hear from the volunteers supporting them and how they gain a great deal by being there for others. 
There were also webinars aimed at those working in schools, community environments, sport clubs and workplaces, along with a great panel discussion talking about men's mental health. And it was insightful to hear from some of our local elite sportsmen about their thoughts and feelings. So hopefully throughout the month, there's been something there for everyone to access and relate to. This leads on today's session, which will build on the knowledge gained from the past few weeks and help to develop a mental health and wellbeing network within Leicestershire and Rutland. Therefore, our plan for this afternoon is to give you the time to break out into smaller groups to share your experiences and gain an insight into what others are doing. Before that, however, you will see three case studies, all very different projects, with one being delivered in Nottinghamshire, along with two from Leicestershire. There will then be the opportunity to ask questions of those leading on those projects through the Q&A panel. And at that point, we will also hear from Debbie who will give a little outline of her personal experience and she will also join the panel too. So on to the case studies. And the first one is from James Roughton um, from Rampton Hospital. And James, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Kate. Um, hi, everybody. I hope you're all well and you're keeping well in these challenging times, which are difficult for us all. Um, it's really great to get this opportunity to reflect back on this case that seems like a long time ago now, um, but also get that chance again to look at the um, the best practice and share some of those skills learned. Um, and also thank Nick Roberts, who I've just seen pop up on this call as well. So it's obviously the chair of um, Nothing in Mind. So thank her for actually making the project happen. So um, I think the key points what I really want to get out of this talk today is to show that if a project such as this using multi service collaboration can work in a high secure environment of Rampton. Um, it really can work. The power of sport and physical activity can really be used through projects such as this um, and implemented throughout the community. Uh, so there's a first slide picture of, of the hospital inside of Rampton with some of the um, patients and my staff um, partaking in the project, which are we talking about today? If we could have the next slide, please, Luke. Okay, so what is Rampton Hospital? People may not, may or may not know about Rampton Hospital. Um, what we are, we're one of the three high secure hospitals in, um, in the UK. So we have um, Broadmoor, which is in the south of the country. Uh, it's catering for the uh, patients further south. Uh, we have Ashworth in Liverpool, and we uh, are in the north of North Nottinghamshire on the border of Lincolnshire and South Yorkshire, but we come under Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust. And there's also a fourth high secure hospital in Scotland called Carstairs, but as you may know, um, Scotland has slightly different mental health laws. They're not paired with us in terms of a sister organisation. So the hospital is very big. We've got um, cater for up to 322 patients in total over four care streams. The hospital's kind of broken down into only four hospitals. We have a national learning disability, uh, which also involves a national death service where there are only hospital that caters for high offended and um, high service learning disability and death service. We have our largest directorate, which is the mental health directorate. We have a personality disorder hospital. And um, we used to have a DSPD, which was the dangerous and severe personality disorder unit, which has recently become decommissioned and made one personality disorder service now. And then we also have the national women's service. So again, we're the only high secure hospital in the country that has um, caters for high secure women's needs. So every patient really within our service is deemed to be at a grave danger to themselves or the public. So that's why they're in the hospital. So it's a kind of really a cross between a hospital that is very much a hospital based on recovery um, in terms of with maximum security in terms of like a category A prison. So we were opened a lot of history in uh, Rampton. We opened in 1912 and initially accommodating 300 patients and we were open as an overfill for Broadmoor Hospital and that peaked um, at uh, 1,300 patients in the, 40, in the uh, 1940s and now say so we've roughly got about 320 patients currently. Okay thank you Luke, next slide. That's just a bit of an area of view so you can see the, the vastness of it. We really are in a lovely part of the country and it's very rural in the middle of 
nowhere really. Um, it's natural and mile radius all the way around. I had a nice job around there at lunchtime today. It's very important you know, learning from this conference to look after our well-being and work-life balance. So I make myself go out for a run, even with the rain today. I don't want this light back. I came in Leicester, but it's um, pretty gloomy up here today. So I made myself go for a run around there. It's really, really beautiful grounds. Uh, we can see the facilities we've got as well. Each directorate um, has its own all-weather pitch. And you can see how the hospital set out there. It keeps you fit just walking around it, as you can imagine. Okay, next slide, please, Luke. So these are some of um, the facilities I have within my service of health and fitness. I'm head of health and fitness there at the hospital. Uh, we really have got world-class facilities. It's what attracted me. I used, you know, I used to work at Leicester at Arnold Lodge Medium Secure Hospital and really wanted me to come and work here um, because of the world-class facilities. I have a vision for my team to be a leading provider and centre of excellence in physical activity and sport for the NHS. And there's no reason why you know, we can't achieve that with the facilities we've got. Uh, we've started working with Ludbury University. I did a guest lecture last week, actually, last Monday, talking to some of their exercise um, psychologists on um, opportunities to work in the NHS and what it's like working in a high school hospital. And I think a mission which you know, I'd hope as partners on the call today we can help come uh, call of arms is my big mission is to have physical activity and sports therapy recognised within the NHS as a, cre a credible clinical profession as important as psychologists and doctors. Um, we have got a fair way to go yet, but I think with the research we're bringing out and working with Loughborough and projects such as this, and the research that mind are doing, I think, yeah, this is going to really push that further. I think that's you know, really where, where we want to be at. So some of the facilities you can see there, they have a fantastic swimming pool. Uh, we have a um, sports, sports hall, a gym, um, and the central pitch you can see, the nice open space is the new Westfields area, which was a collaborative project with the patients and they designed it, picked the equipment, and um, they kind of planned the activities. We, held the first high secure marathon the other other um other summer i think it's just before lockdown and it shows again what can be achieved when um yeah, when you when you've got that determination we're working very very differently and i spoke to kate on the call before before this just as a bit of a planning how we're working currently with my team and i'm very proud of how we've worked through um this pandemic we've got all these fantastic facilities but the challenge as it is for all of you guys and this profession we are working is that we can't use these great facilities at the moment so we've been all my team have been redeployed to work on the, the wards and we've had nightingale units set up and you know that is very anxiety provoking for my team as it is for a lot of us and we've I'm very proud how they've responded and been very innovative in how they're going to provide physical activity and continue the patients to motivate them and keep them busy and where they can't come off the wards. So there's been lots of activities, maybe another another presentation, another day, perhaps, Kate, on what we've been doing, training patients in in their on the wards, patients in long-term segregation that are literally behind glass, being engaged in um, yoga and stretching activities and again just that power of physical activity in sport if we can engage patients that are in long-term segregation and in that end of the spectrum in terms of you know how well they are you know, sport can really help anybody as we all know okay if we have a look at the next slide please Luke. so the get set go mind project which you're here to talk about today uh, it's the first time we've ever been able to offer a vocational coaching qualification in a hospital. It's something we're really proud of and something we're really grateful for Nick and the Get Set Go team for funding and making it happen. So a little bit of background where we came to, why, why we, we had this. We had an existing relationship with Nottingham FA Disability as well as um, Nottinghamshire Mind. And whenever in the past we'd had funding, what we tended to do is use that funding to have a time limited project working with Notts County and um, the Notts County would come in, fantastic coaches, deliver some training with the patients who absolutely love football. Uh, but once they were finished, you know, they'd go, the patients would go back to doing their normal programmes and it, there was just no sustainability or succession planning. Mm -hmm. So when Nicola approached me with this funding, uh, we thought it'd be a really great opportunity to get the patients trained up, to get the coaching qualification, to be able to have some peer support, to teach their peers, run some sessions and actually work towards something as in terms of a vocational qualification that's massive for their motivation and their recovery so that that's what we did so we set out to run for keepers 
a five week course, it seemed a long time ago now reflecting back on it, a five, a five week course, we had eight patients and actually two of my staff that were also um, on, on the course that so they learned alongside the patients. And again, there was that peer support um, that seemed through each other through it. It was fantastic that all eight patients actually um, had 100% attendance and passed the course, which as we know, motivation can be low with people suffering from mental health issues. And for that to have 100% attendance was you know, remarkable. Some of the challenges you obviously know, wasn't all plain sailing. I think in a high secure environment, it's a lot of challenges. It's the same type of security really as if you were going through an airport, so you can't bring any shops, you can't bring computers, um, you're searched every time you come in through the uh, security. So it caused quite a few challenges for our uh, facilitating staff to have to send pr um, presentations and teaching resources in advance, have all the materials checked, even things as taking staples out of the books is something that you take for granted that you have to think, you're know, totally focused on security and, and risk management, and which the, the, the coaches responded excellently to that. Uh, again, also, well, I think when we were going to do this as a physical conference back in last uh, March, the guys that within my team that set this up and need the credit uh, was Ian Wilkes and Greg Jones, who actually led the project. And they've actually written a published an article, which was published through Nottingham F FA. So I don't know if we can send the link to that, Kate, to have a look some more, more detail in there. Um, I say the patients really, really enjoyed it and achieved it. We've got some feedback. Go on the next slide. So some of the uh, feedback there. Really, is football is something that the patients can have some normality, and playing with their, their um, friends on the same ward. And it really, they do take it very seriously. But it is that such an important part of that routine and structure for them. Something really nice about wanting to pass the skills they'd learnt on to their families. They've not had any success. You know, sometimes they've had some really, really horrific upbringings. And to actually have something positive to come out of it, and it's, it's so, so good that they've achieved that. Join learning with their friends. And the last one's very heartfelt about wanting to think about his local areas and not having chances, and actually having some means and purpose to life. And if there's some further feedback we'll finish with, which a patient actually um, reading his acceptance speech when he graduated, which we'll, um, we'll finish with. So just another, another slide, please, Lou. What was really nice was the patients were so appreciative of this um, opportunity that they came up with the idea of wanting to fundraise for Mind and give something back. And there's a picture there of Nick um, getting the award, which the um, the cheque, which was actually just under two and a half thousand pounds the patients raised. So that was a collaboration with a community project where we had events going on outside, somebody did a sponsored bike ride, and then the patients had their own sponsored activities within the hospital. And we coincided the graduation, the patients getting there level one certificate with um, with the award where we handed that over to Nick. It was a great day, we got some great memories from that. Okay, I think the last slide now, Luke, if you move on to that, we should be able to hear from one of the patients, it has to be anonymous, but then um, we'll hear from this patient now, which is great lasting feedback. I have a charity mind. It was a brilliant idea where staff and patients came together to acquire the skills, knowledge, experience, and confidence to run their very young football coaching group. It was a mixture of people with different capabilities, but worked really well for everyone involved. There was an engaged and relaxed environment, and the FA coaches made it really fun and easy to digest for everyone, and we all got involved. Not only do we have the legitimate level one qualification, we now have the tools and confidence to bring what we learn to our everyday active lives. For example, warming up, team activities, and goal-focused exercises. Thanks to everyone who made this happen. Everyone who got involved, the FA coaches, and the charity mind, Keep sessions like this coming to Rampton. I think that says it all, really. So I think that's um, you know, how much they appreciated it, and you know, real heartfelt thanks to um, Nick, Nicky at um, Minds, and also this, just that opportunity, really. And where next for us? Um, well, we've got to get back to some kind of normality post COVID, and get my areas back open and my staff back doing their jobs, which they've trained for. Uh, we want to get the patients being able to use their certificates. And we've also had talks about introducing a refereeing course as well. So it's just the beginning. And I really, really strongly recommend you taking this opportunity up and, and using the Get Set Go programme. So thanks again, Kate, for the opportunity to talk about this case study and look forward to answering any questions after. Okay. 
Thank you, James. That was really interesting to listen about the work that you've been doing at Rampton. And I think we all acknowledge that there's challenges with all programmes, but just listening to the logistics of how you have to put things in place, sort of you know, when you talk about the teaching resources, it's not quite as straightforward as it would be. In an Hello, episode. today I'm going to discuss how we can improve the mental well-being of vulnerable young people and families using a positive activity. Sorry, Kate. <laughs> That's all right. I know you always like to shut me up, Luke. But, um, but yeah, um, just yeah, uh, just to say, yes, thanks again, James. Really insightful, as I said earlier. And, and I think um, the, the feedback from uh, the, the guy on the last slide, you know, it says it all, really. It's we're using sport as the tool to enable more tools to be used, like he spoke about the confidence that has been gained. And um, it, he's got something to look to in the future with the pro from the program that he's been on. So that that was really insightful. So thank you for sharing that with us. And yes, yeah, so moving on to the next uh, case study. Um, this is uh, from Blaby District Council with their physical activity pathway. Referral pathway. The Positive Activity Referral Scheme is a one-to-one -one intervention where a PARS coordinator will work with a young person or family to improve their mental health by setting small and achievable targets based on their interests and what they want to get out of the scheme. Um, by enabling this one-to-one -one support, we remove all the stigma away from participating in community physical activity and also working to remove some barriers or negative experiences that they may associate with physical activity, which could have had an impact on their health and well-being. So moving forward onto the process. So we've looked to create a streamlined and quick process so that we can work, aim to work with the referral as quick as possible. This is because through our experience in consultation, we've understood that working with vulnerable young people and families when they decide to do something, there's a short window before their minds change and they decide not to go down that path. Therefore, we like to act quickly and engage with them as soon as possible so that we can continue on their development pathway. So with the referrals, we work with support services. They're the best audience to work with as they can directly um, impact the young people but also they're working with them and understand their needs greater than we might because we're not working with them directly. Once they've been referred um, by a support worker or the Children and Family Wellbeing Service, we look to use a screening process. For this we use validated questionnaires, it enables us to understand their current level of mental health and also allows us to make sure our level of support is right for them. If we're at this process, we understand that their mental health um, that their mental health is too low, then we may um, ask them to go and uh, access other support services. This is because we're not mental health specialists, so they are better getting support from someone that is specialised in that area. And then at a later stage, we can review their application again and they can come back to us. So once they've been referred and we've gone through the screening process, we look to book in an initial consultation. This is the most vital stage of the process because we need to make a positive impact from the off and look to build rapport and trust with, with the participant and their families so that they can work with us to achieve their own targets and um, have a positive journey with us. It's important to remember that goals don't always have to be physical activity related at this stage. Although it is a physical activity referral pathway, the goal is about improving their lifestyle and mental health. Physical activity is simply a tool in doing this. Therefore, for an example, we've had an individual that wanted to improve their relationship with their dad. It was getting them down, they weren't engaging in school or the community and all they wanted was to build that relationship. We've worked with the parents and the individual to identify badminton as a suitable activity for both of them. They went and participated at the local leisure centre when over a three month period, they re-established re a strong connection um, as a father and son, and this led to an increase in confidence. This fur further led to the son joining a badminton club and re-engaging education. 
So the level of activity he was doing, the activity he was doing was irrelevant. What was relevant was that that activity provided an opportunity for him to improve his mental well-being and re-establish himself within society and his family. The final stage of the progress is support. Um, so for us, we provide consistent support throughout a 12-week period. We use different support methods to meet their needs. So this could be automated tech services, reward charts, phone calls, regular meetings, um, and just to establish and build that rapport and continue to offer support. Um, we also provide introduction to coaches and instructors and make sure that the instructors and coaches they're working with are suitably qualified and understand the needs of the individual so that they can provide the necessary support and build good rapport with them to make them feel welcomed into what can be quite a daunting environment. Um, the other really important thing with regards to this is although the direct need is with the young person and their needs, it's also important to support the parents. The parents can be under a lot of stress, it can be very difficult for them having to work full time, deal with family life, but also have the additional needs um, of, of their child or children. So for us, not only do we work directly with the children, but we offer support to families. This can be just meeting up for a coffee and having a chat, but also providing physical activity opportunities for them to give them some respite. So, Moving on from that, we go on to workforce. Workforce is the most integral part of this programme and the reason why we have been so successful. It all starts from recruitment, so recruiting the right person and the right coordinator. For this, we based it on personality um, over skill set and knowledge. We can teach skills and knowledge to, part, um, to our staff and volunteers, but having the right personality to be able to connect with vulnerable people, those with disabilities, additional needs, and families where there's a lot of stress um, in their environment. So for us, we recruited a PARS coordinator that had no needs, was more from a support and inclusive background rather than physical activity, and they're able to really work and connect with our referrals. Further to, further to this, we created an accreditation scheme. It's a three-tier process for bronze, silver and gold, where we work with clubs, instructors and, and physical activity providers, including our leisure centre, and staff within that to upskill them and understand mental health and, in, um, and disabled participants and how we can engage with them a lot better. So working with this, we go through a bronze criteria, which is some basic criteria all clubs um, and providers should already have in place, but we just double check and work with them to get things in place if they haven't already. As we move up, so silver criteria is again, looking more of a mental health background, getting some mental health first aid, some online training, training around autism, disability awareness, um, and also looking for them to support some of our events just to help build rapport and establish connections with some of the families they may be working with. And then the gold is where we work with the clubs a lot deeper and a lot more personal. So we look to get some mental health ambassadors, a full mental health first aider, um, we work with them for a three-year sport development plan, which will help develop not only their club, but also the inclusive side of their club, looking at accessible facilities and equipment, and also um, looking to get at least one coach from every age group to, in, to deliver inclusive activity courses. So now the important part, looking at the impact. Over the past year, um, through the... 2019-20 year, we've upskilled over 50 coaches and volunteers. So this is through online training, CPD courses, mental health first aid, a variety of different courses to help them understand mental health, mental well-being, and disabled participants a lot better. Um, we have over 20 sports clubs and instructors accessing the accreditation scheme, including both of our leisure centres, which means that we have a very extensive offer to offer um, to provide to the families. Um, and also for the parents as well to access some of our instructors um, and their classes as well. Um, we've got a 
self-sustaining pathway for vulnerable young people and families to access physical activity in the community. They're working with a support worker, they come to us and then we transition them into the community where they can continue participating um, for as long as they wish. From uh, our pre and post evaluation, we've established that 87% of referrals have improved their mental well-being, 93% have improved their self-efficacy, and we've had over 100 secondary school pupils and 40 families access the scheme during the 2019-20 year. For us, the impact is there, the evidence is there, but this comes down to our ability to engage and have an appropriate workforce to work with these young people. Without that, we wouldn't have had half of the successes that we have. So looking at a couple of case studies, as you can see, um, we've got parents saying that they can they give uh, the confidence and self-belief to leave the house. Um, we, there was a particular young person who was severely autistic. Um, he struggled to engage and interact with people. He couldn't sit still. He wouldn't really talk to anyone. Um, he wouldn't engage in anything that was different to his normal lifestyle. He's very set in routine and wouldn't really explore anything out of that. Within one consultation and a couple of meetings, we'd managed to break down a few barriers. He was talking freely, looking to engage a lot more services, um, and also looking to engage and build friendships with people within the clubs he was working in. So that was a real big impact for us and shown how much this program can actually improve the well-being. But for us, it wasn't just the well-being of the young person, it was the impact that it had on the mother. She was very stressed under a lot of strain with her work, balancing other children, trying to make sure she gave everyone an equal amount of time and appreciation. And for her, this took some stress away and she's got one of the best relationships she's had with her son um, since she can remember. And then the final one is a participant that was within a school, gender confused individual that just felt, felt they didn't fit in society. We put on a group class um, within the school where we targeted um, young females that just felt a little bit out of um, the social circle, weren't really engaging socially and in education. Um, we created a fun environment where they had a lot of freedom to do their own activities and express themselves. And this has led to this particular individual understanding their gender a lot more, feeling accepted in society and feeling confident enough to express themselves without judgment or bias. And it's led to her building a lot more friendships where she now socializes both in and outside of education. Um, and she's a lot happier in the household as well. So that's had a massive impact on her. If you want to find out more about PARS or how you, we could run PARS in your area, or just to see our more detailed presentation on kind of the processes and things we've took, please contact us using the contact details available. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, that was Nathan Smith, but it'll actually be Darren Farish who's going to be joining our panel from Blaby District Council to talk about that programme and answer any questions that you have. Again, a really interesting case study there, um, looking at all the various aspects of work that's going on and clearly some really positive outcomes from the work they've been doing. So last but not least, um, I'd like to show you the case study now um, from Sam Chamberlain, um, who's with the Active Charmwood team. Prior to COVID-19, um, we've previously built up a strong rapport with the housing team at Charmborough Council, delivering seated physical activity and um, twilight games through LRS. Um, residents really enjoyed um, taking part in these. They found it fun. They really enjoyed the social element. Um, we've also got strong links with our care homes and the activity coordinators. Many of those attended our um, seated physical activity training package. Um, due to the lockdown, um, we've not been able to go into these care homes or sheltered accommodations and deliver sessions. Um, so it became apparent um, through conversations with um, our contacts at these sheltered accommodations and the care homes, there was a, a big concern um, for ways of keeping active whilst um, they was at home and stuck in their rooms. Um, the team thought of ways we could encourage the residents um, through simple ways of being active, make, moving more and keeping mobile while at home. Um, it was then from this that we decided to put together a seated physical activity pack 
um, developed by myself um, in a leaflet format. And we also give out stress balls and other leaflets from public health um, to support residents being more physically active at home. We actually got the leaflet endorsed um, nationally, nationally by Revitalise and the and NAPA. So it's National um, Activity ooh, Physical Activity and also Public Health England. So we did get it endorsed um, to ensure that it was safe for people to do at home. So in response to COVID-19, um, Charman set up a community hub to, res to support residents who were shielding and who were vulnerable. And um, so by working in partnership with our local community hub and also those partners at the um, care homes and our sheltered accommodation managers, um, we was able to distribute these packs and ensure that um, by building up that strong rapport previously, um, we would be able to ensure that the leaflets was sent out to people from our target group and that there was going out to the appropriate audience. So I think by building up those relationships um, before giving out the leaflet, we've ensured that they've gone to the right place and it's those people that really need it. We've had some really great feedback from um, our residents. We also produced a survey monkey um, for, our, for our care workers and volunteers to um, complete. We had lots of really good feedback from this. We've also had some really good social media engagement. Um, one of uh, a care home in Abbeyfield, which you'll see pitched on the screen now, our residents taking part in the physical activity um, exercises. They did it outdoors. And as you can see from the photographs, they're all smiling and they're all having fun and being active. So that's what our packs was all about, really. Really nice, easy to follow um, activities that they can do in the garden, they can do it in their room, they can do it in the communal lounge. So making sure that it's also accessible for all. By working with community group leaders, the people who are already working with the target group, encouraging them to make conversations with their service users just over a tea and coffee about the importance of being active. And that I think is a really good way of introducing the leaflets and the packs from a familiar source. Also um, continuing to work with activity coordinators who are based within the care homes to continue to support their residents by utilizing the leaflet. Um, also in progression to our physical activity leaflets, um, we've actually produced five seated physical activity videos. And so we've used one of our local Steady Steps instructors and to deliver these five videos that they can play within their care home, in their communal lounge, or even um, individually on a laptop. They may be able to take the, um, the video to um, their room so they can be physically active in their room. So all the videos are really low intensity and easy to follow. Um, so the care work workers and wardens can sit with them and go through the exercises and make sure that they're um, safe and um, completing it appropriately. I also think um, by working with local volunteers in the area and our take the lead individuals um, to promote our leaflet, I think they've already got the relationships with the people in their community. So if we can educate them to um, talk about the importance of being physically active whilst at home and hopefully introduce our packs is a really good way that we can reach more um, community groups who don't necessarily um, engage with other community groups. Um, also by doing the physical activity, um, encourage people to educate about the mental health benefits that physical activity has. Um, so obviously it makes us stronger and more mobile, but um, what it also does is it improves our well-being and our self-worth. So hopefully by delivering the physical activity sessions in small groups, um, within obviously government guidelines, um, they'll be able to gain physical activity, physical improvements. and also mental improvements. Thank you for that case study, Sam. Really interesting. It sounds to me it's, a, it's 
kind of a case of if they can't come to you, then you'll go to them to make sure that they get their, their physical activity um, um, when they can. Um, again, I think it's a great example of how lots of different, you know, organizations, departments, different groups have come together to, to enable that project um, to go ahead. Um, so yes, thank you um, for those case studies. And I think you'd agree that they're all very, very different um, examples of the great work that's taking place. And um, I'm sure we can all take something away from what we've heard there. Um, so now it's uh, the opportunity really to um, ask some questions. So I'd like to introduce um, our panel. So uh, James, Sam, Darren, and also Debbie, um, who's agreed to, to join our panel today. Um, so before we actually take any questions, I'd just like to invite Debbie to just for a few minutes kind of share some of her thoughts uh, with us, really regarding how um, physical activity has impacted on her um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but also what made the difference um, to you actually getting involved and becoming that great advocate um, that you now have become um, for physical activity. Hi, thank you, Kate. Um, I shall try my best to answer the, the remit. Um, well, I've, I've only been involved in physical activity for approximately five years. Um, prior to that, I was uh, very overweight, very unwell mentally. I've been um, under the mental health services for almost 35 years now. Um, I was very overweight. I made excuse after excuse not to get involved in physical activity. And it was meeting um, a lady at the University of Nottingham where I do some uh, casual work that changed my life. Um, and she inspired me to start thinking about how physical activity could maybe help my mental health. Initially, I was very resistant, um, but I thought she was such an inspirational lady that I would give it a go. Um, initially, she invited me to attend an aqua aerobics event um, or class rather. And I remember the day it was a cold day and I was walking through the University of Nottingham campus towards the swimming pool. In my head, I was, well, my legs were going on automatic, but my head was saying, you don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. Everybody's against you. Why should you do it? You know, it's not going to make any difference to me. Um, anyway, I got all of them, almost all the way to the swimming pool and decided that, no, I wasn't going to do it. Little did I know that my lady that inspired me was driving up the drive to the swimming pool and saw me and stopped the car and said, where are you going? Anyway, to cut a long story short, um, she persuaded me to go and I attended the aquarobics uh, class. Hated every minute of it. And then I was very lucky that Hannah, who the lady, um, invited me to go for coffee with her. And we talked about what might make the difference for me because I had no idea about physical activity and what my potential was or what I wanted to do and achieve. Anyway, we, we, we chatted and I've, we, I remember we chatted about what I did when I was at school uh, a long time ago now, but I always loved playing badminton at school. And uh, the University of Nottingham have excellent badminton team and a fantastic international coach who I was introduced to through Hannah and um, I'm now lucky enough to have him as my coach, my badminton coach so I feel very privileged for that but looking at how it's made a difference and what makes a difference is that I think we have to listen to people about what they want to do um, obviously we have 
limited resources and limited time, so we can't do everything differently for everybody. But if we have the activities that may interest people or don't interest people, can we reroute them to somewhere else that does have that activity? My initial thoughts about going to the gym were um, the, the same as a lot of people are about, well, I can't go to the gym. I'm old and from pay very fat and all the students were looking at me. Um, they weren't looking at me. They were had their headphones well implanted into their ears um, and were listening to their music and their podcasts as they do. And so I had started to play badminton and I'd started to go to the gym. And to cut a long story short, I my mental health started to improve. I still have a lot of problems with my mental health because they're well embedded. I My diagnosis is personality disorder. Um, but I now, previous to lockdown, I played badminton maybe five times a week and walked every single day. But during lockdown, I have been inspired to carry on being physically active, active um, mainly walking initially. Um, the government allowed us an hour to go out each week, each day, which I took up very reluctantly. My daughter persuaded me to go out for a walk because my mental health was deteriorating. Um, and I've been out for a walk and I now go out for a run every day. And by the end of the week, I hope to have accumulated a thousand miles. So I've been really active. Um, I think to sum it all up really, active physical activity for me has been a massive impact on my mental health and a massive impact on my friendships, which before I started to go to the gym, I barely had any friends. And I got to know a lot of people. I got to know people through my coaches. And I cannot advocate for it more than possible I could do because it has made such a massive, massive impact on me and the people around me as well in my family. I hope that suits what you wanted me to say. Yes, thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much for that. It's really interesting listening to you talk and it, it kind of took me back to something that um, Nathan said um, in his case study about it's having the right people involved um, and that definitely made the difference with yourself um, having that coffee, that chat. And also, you, you, again, you make a really good point about being listened to. I think in our sort of sport world, we're very good at coming up with what we think people would like to do. Um, there's lots of different initiatives, et cetera, taking place. And we think, oh yeah, that'd be great. But we don't always ask people, what is it that you would like yeah. to do? Um, and I think, again, that, that that's really, um, kind of reaffirms something for me that we, we should be doing more listening. Um, yeah. So thank you for sharing that with us, Debbie. Um, so um, it's over to, to everyone else now, really, um, for any questions um, that you have for, for Debbie, James, Sam or Darren. Um, yes, so anybody got any questions? Can I see, Joe? You've you've put um, a question here. I didn't know whether you wanted to ask it or I I can read it out for you, but um, Joe's sort of um, reiterated that some great case studies there. Um, a number of the case studies have a targeted approach with a particular group. Do you have any thoughts on how we upscale to reach a wider population? Um, e.g. promoting links of physical activity and mental well-being for all, or do you think a targeted approach is best? I think um, I found um, over lockdown especially that um, I, I think people have been, in Nottingham where I live, I can only share, share my experience of that, I think a lot of people have been targeted via the internet. Um, and my... I also would like to advocate for those that don't use the internet and those that 
because they may not have it, but also because they don't like it. Um, so people that don't have the technology or the willingness to use technology in a lot of times have been ignored. Um, and I think targeting them and finding the people who, especially the vulnerable people who can't leave their house. Um, we've I've had discussions around um, including in food food packs like little leaflets with exercises on or getting people to ring other people and find out about what their exercises are and, and targeting those that don't use technology. Thank you, Debbie. And I don't know, Sam or Darren, if you've either of you have got any thoughts on, on that. I mean, obviously what Debbie's just said kind of relates to the work that you've been doing, Sam, with the activity pack, sort of making sure that people have, have got that information, not necessarily having to, to use technology um, to, to receive it. I don't know if you've got any thoughts. Yeah, so um, through our community hub, um, when we're delivering the food parcels, um, our volunteers would have that initial conversation when dropping the food parcel off, asking firstly how they are, um, if they're managing to be active, and if they wanted any support with being active, and if, if they wanted to take on that support, then we would say, oh, well, we've got some physical activity packs and would show them the leaflets and how they can be more active at home. Um, we've also been making calls to some of the vulnerable um, categories in Charmwood through our GP referral programme and our Steady Steps programme. So we've been making courtesy calls to um, those residents, asking if they have access to the internet. And you're quite right, a lot of people didn't have access to the internet and they just didn't really have any, any idea where to start really and confidence of what, what how, what activity even do at home to keep active and um, so we've um, spent the last couple of weeks actually delivering physical activity packs to those um, vulnerable residents and um, so they're able to read the leaflet you know just put it on the fridge and they can pull it off as and when and hopefully do a little bit of physical activity in their day so that's what we've we've been doing. Thank you Sam. I suppose from our end it's 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 the balance in answer to sort of Joe's question we've seen some great outcomes from what we've got but we've also put the time and effort and resource in working with individuals on on an individual basis so in terms of upscaling that you either dilute that support <clears throat> that people get or this additional resource into into doing that over and over again um and I suppose it's that balance to find at what at what level do you you know reduce that support that it becomes you know that much less effective, um, and we we don't we don't know that yet. But say so we've we've certainly gone from a very you know sort of so not intensive but you know personalised approach with regular contact and support, um, which has worked. But then how far you scale that back before it doesn't become effective, we're not quite sure yet. Thanks, Darren. I, I'd actually got a question for you. Um, ah, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't going to let you off the hook. Um, ah. It was just, I was just interested in, in the case study, the part about workforce development and the work that you're doing with the clubs and deliverers on the sort of the bronze, silver, gold kind of scheme, uh, which I think is great. But ha when you introduced that scheme, how was it received with the clubs? Um, short of telling fibs, um, we went for the clubs that we're engaging with anyway, um, mm -hmm. which admittedly were the larger ones. Um, so in terms of when you're looking at like the, the bronze accreditation, you know, the, the, uh, any proactive club should be, you know, sort of covering all that, all that part of accreditation. But I think there, from what we, what we've seen, there is an acknowledgement that there are, um, there are young people out there that want to take part in in sports and physical activities but sometimes the environment isn't quite right and i say i think it's probably where the bigger clubs are probably slightly better off because a lot of the bigger clubs have more people and then tend to have two or three teams or groups of people in different age groups where they might have their sort of competitive team which um which doesn't suit most of the people that work but then have more of the you know your more fun social so social team where you do have your 
people there it's all it's with you know sort of inclusive training and backgrounds to try and you know basically get people to enjoy playing not not doing it competitively necessarily but enjoy enjoy doing it um there's certainly uh a, a, a knowledge that it was required and in fairness there's a willingness not not 100 percent throughout <laughs> throughout the club willingness but certainly people within within each each organization that were willing to willing to do that and that's all we were looking for especially in the start but if you're just having one or two people in a large club for example it's one or two people that can lead you know lead this and we can we can get into clubs with and that's what we're able to to do and then kind of then start spreading any you know sort of you know, sort of standard practices or um, you know policies and practices within the club, um, and it's then trying to build that um, that sort of ethos within the club that is you know that it is a, a welcome and inclusive club um, for you know for anybody for any reason. Thanks, and um, I guess as well sometimes it's I know myself. You know, you might not be too keen to actually embark on something that seems quite new, and it might seem a bit onerous. But actually, once you get into it, you, you can see the benefits, can't you? And and the positive impact that it has on both the club coaches and then the the participants and as that, well. Yeah, and that first and that first impression is massive. If somebody goes in really apprehensive and they go to that first session and it's horrendous for them, it, no, no one, you know, getting at them or no one's talking to them, it's not friendly, it's not welcoming, then they're not going to come back and they may never come back to anything like that ever again because that's that's then ingrained on, you know, on, on the mind, so to speak. So that first impression of going to, and again, that's part of the programme, it's going to the right clubs with the right people um and matching people up to make sure that you know their, their needs are catered for because uh you know a wrong move at that point um could you know could basically be be, be lights out for you know <laughs> for you know for, for someone yeah definitely that you've kind of lost that person for good then haven't you oh thank you for that darren um i've actually got another question for for james um i was kind of wondering you know with the programs that you have in place how do you motivate the patients to get involved initially but then to, to stick with the program because you know clearly you're working with quite a diverse group of of patients there and with lots of challenges anyway without then having to kind of take on physical activity which for some of them might have been quite a new experience yeah that's right Kate I think motivation is um, one of the biggest challenges we have you as we all know as um, exercise professionals we can put the greatest sessions on with the greatest facilities but it's getting people to continue to come to those sessions once we set that up and also to not to, to have the resilience of the, the staff as well not to lose heart in trying to, to motivate I think it's about building rapport and listening I think Debbie summed it up with that great case study she gave that you have to listen and make that connection and I think that's it. it's about finding that link and trying to build on that and to answer um, Joe's question as well about how do we scale it and how do we work with it it's just the vehicle sports or physical activity it's just the vehicle we're using at the hospital to treat patients and actually give you know, help them with the recovery and so it's kind of find out what find out what that is so understand them listen and then um, make it interesting and fun really Great, thank you. Can I, can I just come back on that, Kate? Yes, by all means. Yeah, and yeah, I think motivation for me has come from initially people saying to me, remember how it makes you feel when you do it. And so if I'm having a bad day and I don't want to go out for a run, I try to remember what it makes me feel like. And then I go out for a run and I realise, yes, it does make me feel better. Oh, oh thanks, Debbie. Um, I think Joe's got um, a couple of questions. Joe, I do. Thank you, Kate. So I've got one for Debbie and one for James. So Debbie, if I do yours um, first, if that's okay. Yeah. Nationally, um, there's a big push um, to encourage um, healthcare professionals um, to promote um, physical activity to their patients. Um, you mentioned that you'd been um, in the mental health services for a, a few years. Did mental health practitioners openly talk to you around physical activity and try and encourage you into physical activity at all? Or would you say that was, um, it didn't happen very often at all? It never happened, never. 
um, I I now have the problem of them actually telling me that I am doing too much activity. Um, okay. Yeah, it's it's um, yeah. I was never it was never advocated to me to become physically active, um, but now I had a conversation with my psychiatrist last week who suggested that I was doing far too much. But I said to him, it keeps me safe and it helps me survive. And do you think you would have potentially picked up physical activity slightly earlier if they'd had that conversation with you at all? Most definitely, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie. That's really, really useful. You're welcome. Um, my second question um, is for, the, for you, James. I think it's um, really interesting um, to hear uh, an NHS trust taking um putting physical activity at the heart of their delivery. My question probably is, are there people like you in uh, Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland? And if not, how can we further engage with mental health services um, to make sure that they see the importance of physical activity and prioritise it in their service plans? Well, thanks for your question, Mrs. Spokes. Um, I think we definitely have got it within not the only um, position in NHS where this exists. I know we've got Ashley on the call at the moment as well that's um, runs the services on Lodge and does a great job there with his team and um, so it's it, it is embedded in in NHS um, my campaign and mission is for it to be seen as more credible credibly cr clinical so like you were talking there with Debbie and so that early intervention that it's seen as a, a credible intervention as opposed to a diversion therapy so I know myself and speaking for Ashley as well here is that sometimes our professions are seen as a diversion so we'll go and have a kick around in the football to, in, on the, in the sports one take your mind off the problems that we we all know that sports so much more than that and, if, and the routine and the, the actual um, physical benefits that can come from physical activity is a lot more than just diversion so it's about campaigning that getting it lobbying it you know with parliament we're looking at actually there's an exercise professionals in mental health network form that I'm part of and we're actually looking at taking it to the highest level to see how do we get a accredited course um, as part of the allied health professionals so we need it to be given a professional governing body status as you know, say speech and language therapists occupational therapists and psychologists so we're seen as a, a credible profession and that's that's the ultimate challenge and that's what i've really took a great opportunity to speak at the guest lecture at Loughborough last monday to say that this challenge is what we're putting on to the new academics coming up you know if they can continue with the research that's being done now you know, everything's re research based, isn't it? Everything needs to be evidence so if we can get that, then it's going to be embedded in um, NHS structures and in clinical structures. That's that's what we, we need to do. So that answered, Joe, was the second part of the question as well. And um, it, it it does. Um, I suppose for us, our traditional way and potentially would be going to some of those mental health services. Um, but I think you're right. They probably see us um, see us more as potentially as a bit of a and added on an intervention and it's how we embed that into their policies and processes so that it's not just seen as a nice to do physical activity but actually can be um, seen as a, as a key part um, in, in terms of reaching their, their outcomes but I think that's really interesting to hear that it's some potential national advocacy work that needs to be done for that. Influencing and getting those links again if you can have like a, a consultant or a GP that locally that you can build those links with and have them use exercise as a proper prescriptive intervention that's you can start building the links and then using that as the the, the um, evidence base and doing things like this writing case studies up and, and showcasing it i think also more working with particularly for organization working with um ashley at arnold lodge for exit route so i always thought when i i used to have the job that ashley's got there at arnold lodge and we set these are great facilities and then we started setting up exit routes to when patients had section 17 leave from the home office they're allowed to go out and access the community and it's about setting up systems in place so that confidence will be there when they move on giving them positive habits some of the perhaps they're not positive habits they've had in the past and ready to go once they leave that's great thanks james and it sounds like potentially a conversation which i'm sure kate's probably picking up with ashley around support we can do um locally Hi, I'll just introduce myself quickly then. I'm Ash, I work at Arnold Lodge, so I do a similar job to what James does but locally in Leicester. Um, and I ditto what he says about uh, the important role we play. 
in patients with mental health? Because obviously we're seen as a bit of a extra cur curriculum sometimes, don't we, James? Mm. Um, and it's not important, like the work we do can like reduce some risk in interest building and obviously I work within the community so I take patients out and you know um, build community integration so there's a big part we can play but obviously we need more weight and more recognition I think moving forward. Thanks Ashley that's really useful. Uh yeah, thanks, Ashley. And um, we kind of made contact, um, I think, Friday. Uh, sorry, I've not been able to get back to you yet, yeah. but definitely uh, would like to kind of um, have that conversation with you of how we can support what you're doing um, and vice versa, and also linking into colleagues at the Bradgate Mental Health Unit as well. So um, yeah, I'll, definitely, I'll definitely be getting in touch with you. And, and, and thank you. I'm glad you were able to, to join us this afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me. Oh, no problem. You're more than welcome. Um, are there any more questions? Um, if not, um, we'll now go into those uh, breakout rooms where there's going to be another opportunity for you to have further conversations and, and ask any, any further questions there. Um, so I'd like to um, thank James, Sam and Darren, who are going to be helping facilitate those conversations in the breakout rooms and also to introduce and thank Louise Dukes and Nick Roberts of Mind who are also going to be leading some of those, those conversations as well. So we've probably got about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, it isn't very long I'm sorry, but um, we'll go into those breakout rooms now and then we can catch up uh, following that um, just to see if there's any further feedback. So we'll we'll come back together at twenty five past three. Thank you.
I'm going to share script, so I'm going to invite everyone back now, mate. Is that what you want us to do? You're on mute. Yes, please. Yeah, no worries, mate. I want to know when they're back. They'll come in, you'll see. Oh, right. <laughs> so they've got all break, they've just had a message to say that all breakout rooms will close in. They've got this 60 second thing. Oh, you're a star. Thank you. No worries, mate. No worries Thank at all. We'll catch you in a sec. You happy with that being the slide? Yeah. You happy with that being the slide we start on, mate? Yeah. Um, but you're I'm gonna ask if you want to say something. Absolutely. About, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. So there's lots of discussion in our group, which was good. So, and Louise yeah. is from Mind as well, isn't she? Yes, she is. 
just a shame or couldn't join us. Okay, I think we've got everybody back together now. Um, is there any feedback, any just kind of any um, brief observations from some of the, the discussions that you've had? I'm happy to go first if you want me to, Kate. Yeah, from... Yes, thank you, Jo. Um, so I was in a group with Debbie and I think we had um, a really insightful um, conversation. I probably picked up Hannah, your question with Debbie in terms of what can our instructors do um, to um, make the sessions more welcoming. And I think Debbie raised the point that the instructors that she's worked with have all been trained around um, mental awareness, but they've really supported her to, um, to identify small goals um, and have supported her even when she's not necessarily met those goals, but to set, um, set new goals. So I thought that was really um, interesting. I think um, we also had a conversation around um, health professionals and how we can um, support those. Had a conversation around um, lockdown and um, the types of activities um, that, that Debbie's been doing um, during um, lockdown. And then picked up on a couple of motivational um, quotes that Debbie's um, kindly shared with me around the messages that we could be putting out there to encourage um, people to, to be more active. So really useful conversation from, from my point of view. So thank you, Debbie, for sharing your story. Thank you, Jo. Has anyone else um, got any feedback they'd like to share? Yeah. Samantha and I were, uh, there was only Samantha and I in our group, so uh, we were just having a chat really about how um, you engage people without even know, you know, without them even knowing they're doing physical activity as a really good starting point. So we were just sort of sharing a few ideas around that. Um, and um, yeah, looking at the importance of meeting people at, at their level, really. So actually somebody just moving across the room a couple of times a day might be a massive increase in activity. Yeah, very true, very true. Thank you, Nick, appreciate that. Um, anyone I, got I anything can, else? I can go for a bit, Kate, from us. Yeah. We, we're, we're sort of looking at sort of bigger sort of system bits and pieces. How do we get, you know, workforce, you know, like Joe mentioned, sort of trained up in, in, in awareness, but actually is there a gap then between getting actually getting people to our, our workforce and sessions and actually we need to speak to people like, like Debbie and go okay, what what starts that process what 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 makes you think about or move that you know that process is it through um health professionals in which case by the sounds of it some of them need to be educated <laughs> educated a bit more especially if you're getting told stop doing physical activity you're doing too much um so it, you know there's, a, there's sort of a, a lot of work around that whereas we you know we are trying to do work in mobilizing workforce actually we need to get people to actually access access those people in clubs and instructors in in the first place of which we probably need to do a, a, quite a bit more work and understanding um you know what are those what you know what are those words and trigger or messages that we can get out to you know support and get people starting to change their behavior okay i think thanks oh sorry yeah i was just going to uh, come back i think um we I, I mentioned to joe about peer support as well people like myself who have been there and done that talking to people that maybe haven't done that yet. Um, I found it, I, I was saying to Joe, I found it, um, for me, I love talking about it because it has made that massive difference. And it's not that I like to talk about myself because I hate myself, but I, if, if there was a platform that I could shout to the whole of Great Britain about physical activity and mental health, I would stand on that platform and tell them, because I have been so changed because of it. And it, and I know some people have difficulties in mobilising themselves because of problems, but it's about changing the way they motivate themselves or mobilise themselves. We've all got, 90% of us have got mobility that we can use our arms or we can use our legs. So why not use them? And it, if I could shout from the top of the shard you know please do it and I would 
Thank you, Debbie. Thank you for that. Um, Kate, can I just come to um, Hannah has got her hand up. I just think she wanted to make a comment. Hannah, if you wanted to come yeah. in. Yeah, uh, sorry if uh, there's banging in the background. There was really being knocked down. So if I close the door, the internet shuts out. So <laughs> um, not in a great position. But um, yeah, there were a couple of points that we discussed that I thought were quite interesting. Um, so it was mentioned that um, kind of the idea of physical activity and mental health is not it's not exactly a new thing. Like it's it's something that we hear all the time. It's a very popular narrative in the public, but um, it's. Still um, it's still quite difficult for people to almost believe that. Um, and I was saying how I suppose it's one of those things that's kind of almost um, at the same status as like a lot of other like myths or um, really common health rhetorics like, I don't know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day and da 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 da. You kind of almost think that it's difficult to convince people that it's important because it is just so often said. Um, so I suppose it'd be quite interesting, maybe Debbie has some insight in how how did you really push that without sounding the same as what they've heard a million times before? How do yeah, how do people go from, yeah, this is a thing that I'm hearing just in the back oh well, actually this is something that can impact me and can help me. I'm really sorry, but I didn't get half of that. We can build on that a little bit. Okay, if I can, because I was in um, Hannah's, Hannah's, in, um, Hannah's from Blame District, and we had um, Louise from National Mind as well in our group. So we had some really great conversation. I think some of the, these conferences, what we've missed is that informal conversation and chat where we have this networking. So I think that breakout room really gave us that opportunity. So thanks. So just to, if, again, if you want to chip in, if I'm getting the wrong side of it, Hannah, but Hannah, Hannah was had a really good conversation around it is looking at labeling sometimes that stigma around mental health is still there and i think hannah really put it well about saying maybe we should be looking at rather than saying this is a specialized group for mental people with mental health issues maybe we should just focus on it being a mental well-being group because we acknowledge that we've all yeah. got mental health some days it's good some days it's bad and i think we're looking at is that, is that the right approach hannah tell me if i'm on the wrong track i think that's we were looking at that that it sometimes it is labeling that isn't helpful yeah yeah i i would I would agree with that because um, if some people don't want to talk about their mental health um, being bad and I I have heard of people not going to classes because if they're specified for people with mental ill health they think why should we be separated from those that aren't classified as having a mental health problem um, and for me um, I think I probably would feel the same. I I, I did, um, before lockdown, I started to do some work with Notts County and they do some classes for ladies with mental health problems. And it just felt, it was a good class and I enjoyed it, but it felt a bit like they were, because they were in there, it was confirming that they have mental health problems. Um, and I think for me, I find that quite difficult. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I was just going to say kind of part of what I was saying with that is, um, so I think a lot of the time with all these trainings and all this mental health stuff, and all these conversations, we get a little bit like, oh, here's the mental health people and here's the, the normal people. And it gets very like, this is how you treat someone with mental health rather than, well, actually everyone has mental health whether it's good mental health or mental health condition or maybe they're just feeling a bit anxious about turning up to an exercise class because that's a normal thing yeah. for people to feel um why do we kind of need we don't necessarily need to treat people differently we just need yeah. to kind of think well how do we look after people anyway how you know whether someone has an anxiety diagnosed condition or whether someone has just a bit of feeling of anxiety because they're going into the environment for the first time that that's going to be managed the same way so sometimes i think we talk a little bit too much in mental health language when really it yeah. needs to be yeah. like, think, look after people the way we should yeah i think i think you're right because um i've had um multiple leg operations but they don't have classes for people who've had multiple leg operations um 
and I've had lots of other things. I, I have a a blood clotting disorder where I, I, I've had the minor strokes and they do have classes for people who've had strokes, but it's very, um, yeah, like if you if you break your leg, you don't go to a class that people only can go to if they've broken a leg. So why treat people who've got mental health problems in a class for people that have mental health problems? I think, uh, thank you. Oh. I was going to say sometimes... No, carry on, Hannah. ...isn't about like a particular mental health condition. Um, when I previously worked in Nelson, one of the sessions that we put on was like a, a mum's workout class for um, like ladies that had babies under a year old or something like that. And we had like the toys in the middle with all the babies playing and then they did like a circuit class around the outside. Um, and that was the only targeting around it. But when we kind of got going with it, a lot of things came out that a lot of them had been suffering with uh, postpartum depression and feeling really lonely and isolated after having their first child and suddenly not really being friends anymore. And that group became a bit of a support group for a lot of women that were in the same position. They made friends with people in common and things like that. So it was never, ever meant to be a mental health target session, but it ended up reaching people that had a very specific sort of mental health outcome from it. So I suppose, yeah, it was just around, we can, we can do things that aren't labeled mental health that are still beneficial to people's health. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks, Hannah. And that actually um, leads us nicely into just bringing Luke into the conversation because he's been doing an awful lot of work around our future training and development. And this aspect of um, that sort of person-centered approach is quite a key feature. So Luke, uh, did you want to come in now and sort of outline what um, the proposals are going to be? Yeah, thanks very much for that, Kate. And uh, apologies to Hannah, James, except Louise. I know we've just had, we had a brief conversation. I hijacked their, as I normally do, I hijacked their room, spoke a load of rubbish, and then went and left, gave them no time to speak about it. So I do apologise about that. But yeah, I think just building on what Kate said, and I think um, I've just seen in the chat box a comment from Nick as well um, about how it's important to build the skills of communities to include people with varying needs to mainstream provision. And I think that absolutely kind of hits home with what we're trying to achieve as we move forward with our uh, Active Together Universal Training and Development offer. It's really, um, it's really important that within this offer that we are developing, that we give people a foundational understanding from, from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds, et cetera. It could be your... Uh, person who just wants to get active within their community and wants to facilitate activity for others all the way through to our professional workforce to our community volunteers who are working hard in our traditional and non-traditional clubs our rugby clubs our squash clubs etc so one of the key foundational elements that we're looking at uh, or as part of the wider foundational elements is mental well-being and, and an understanding of mental health and our view moving forward is this, and it has been for a number of years and, and the hard work that Kate's done in terms of um, mental health awareness and mental um, well-being support, we have done that. But what we want to do is make sure that that offer is universal to everyone. So we're looking at how we can do that with mental health and well-being. Now, one of the easy steps to do is to access the fantastic resource that's been set up by Mind and UK Coaching, as we've seen in Leicestershire, we've, um, we've got... Um, uh, what is it, uh, 850 plus people who've already accessed that, and that's since it went live in, in April time. Um, and that resource is still available, and it's heavily subsidised by Sport Sport England. So it's currently 8.99, uh, and people can access that, and, it, and it's there for you when you want. And that's kind of that absolute foundational. We've got a duty of care to all of our participants, their well-being and their health included in that. The second part is to understand, and the next part to that is understanding further wider parts on how that impacts on health and well-being and life and inclusion and equality and things. So we do, we are pointing people towards that duty of care tool that can really help you. Again, that's available through UK coaching and it can really help you understand where your current understanding is 
and where you need to develop. And again, there's a, a huge focus on mental health and, and health and well-being as a whole. The next part to that as we move forward, and this is the critical part for us moving forward effectively with this group, so that, that call to action, is how do we ensure that mental well-being and health, we have that foundational knowledge, but we're also able to translate that into everyday practice. So what that means is not, we do a course, we have an awareness of it, and we've done it, and we're happy, okay? It's then how do we proactively use that knowledge to support people Mental, mental well-being and to support those with mental mental health conditions but making sure it's done across a mainstream environment and that we are inclusive to all and as Debbie's quite rightly pointed out is not making these intersectionalized activity where we've got this siloed approach to mental health and mental well-being it's it, it, we need to develop society not just an individual part of it if we're going to get out of this siloed approach so one of the key bits to that is how do we translate? And before we can translate that into activity, sorry, I appreciate I've just started to look like a ghost because our lights have gone off in our, um, in our uh, office. So I'm just going to move them. That shows how active I am. I'm getting up and I'm being active. Sorry about that. Um, so one of the things we're looking to do is understand from our, our um, population and there's no better people to understand. And we've said throughout this whole conversation about listening to our participants and listening and help them shape what, what we want to do. And that's exactly what we want this group to do. We want those who are working within the mental health institute and wellbeing institutions, incredibly passionate people like Debbie, helping us shape that and sharing bravely sharing and supporting and advocating physical activity and health. I think Debbie made a point about uh, in the chat box about saying, I wish I could um, advocate this nationally and, and things like that. Debbie, the stuff that you're doing now and the stories you're sharing with our um, stakeholders today and you have done on uh, as the rest of the conference and what you do every day, that is the really powerful stuff. So it's okay having that, but we want Debbie to be part of that journey. So what we're asking from this is help us shape that understanding of mental health and well-being, or mental well-being and health, sorry. So yes, we've got that foundational offer through the course and we want people to access that and that's really important, but let's go beyond that and let's make ensure that our, um, our activity moving forward, whether that's facilitating a group walk, walking in the park or within our more traditional clubs, Let's look at that together about how we can truly support mental well-being across all those areas. So we need to now think as a group, what does that look for workforce? How does that interpret to our workforce and, do, and physical activity from both sides, making our mental uh, health and well-being charities aware and our supporters and our practitioners aware of how effective physical activity and sport can be? but also from the other side, ensuring that from physical activity in a sporting environment and, and just be an active situation that those people leading, facilitating, supporting that activity truly understand what it means to be and help people's mental well-being and help those with mental health conditions. So it's not that that's currently in the mix, if you like. It will form a wider offer as we look at other areas of, of, of inequality and look to tackle that through our workforce development plan. But everyone on here is invited to be share, part, become part of that journey, share that journey. And we see, as I was speaking to Louise in our, our group, is how important a, a, a potentially a mind and a mental well-being based on the conversations rather as opposed to just a mental health, but a mental well-being group can really help steer that workforce offer moving forward. I think that's kind of where we are already, Kate. And obviously, yeah. again, happy for my details to be shared with anyone on the call. And please don't hesitate to make contact with me as we start to look at that journey together. Okay, thanks very much, Luke. Thank you for that. Um, I guess that just kind of leads us to go on to what the next steps are. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, probably the main purpose of the conference and certainly today's session was about widening opportunities and supporting each other as organisations. And we've certainly seen some great examples, um, uh, to, not just today, but over the past few weeks of, of how that can be uh, achieved. Um, you know, I'm sort of 
you know, sort of thinking from some of um, the, the sessions we've had and listening to the conversations today, you know, how do we really kind of link in with all those organisations out there and, and individuals um, looking at um, the workforce development, um, as Luke and others have outlined this afternoon, that's crucial uh, to this area of work. Um, thinking about some of uh, the older adult uh, programmes that we have in place and how we can perhaps upscale those with Age UK or certainly link in to benefit the work they're doing. Thinking of the befriending and volunteering programmes um, that we've heard about. We've, we've heard, it's been mentioned a few times, that having the right people involved, again, is crucial to the work that we do. Um, and also, you know, thinking of some of um, the learning from what James spoke about his case study and the work they're doing at Rampton, you know, how do we replicate those kind of programmes um, into our more local NHS um, venues here? Um, so, yes, and thank you to Debbie. Um, I think you've, you've really enhanced today's um, session. Um, I, I said it earlier, there's nothing like hearing um, those personal insights, thoughts and feelings. And, and I'm sure, I know you've given me a lot to think about, and I'm sure you have given the rest of us a lot to think about as well, um, about how we plan things, you know, the considerations that we make and probably above all, listen and or ask the question and then listen to what people um, say um, as to how they, they need things to be in place and, and what they actually would like to do. It made the massive difference with yourself and um, having that conversation with Hannah and um, having that coffee and getting into back into badminton again. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I do know that you know we've got colleagues here today that are from the um, lo locality physical activity and wellbeing teams. Um, we've got many programmes in place that can support. But additionally, we've also got colleagues from our mental health uh, charities, organisations and other organisations that oh, certainly over the last eight months have done a massive, massive job in bringing communities together and keeping communities going, especially those that are, are most in need. So I guess it's how do we bridge the gaps um, to, to creating more opportunities um, and how do we bring all our roles and resources into the mix really. Um, so one thing that we're going to be doing um, is following today, we propose to host a series of reflection sessions. Um, really, they're aimed to be very informal, but it's going to be an opportunity to have just more conversations and to keep making those connections with different uh, partners, different organisations. And the first one of these is going to take place on the 7th of December. Uh, next Monday, I believe, at two o'clock, and we'll make sure that the details of those are sent to everybody. Uh, we will plan more in the new year. And I think, um, going back to a comment that you made, James, earlier, you know, you spoke about uh, going through this COVID period, you know, there's a session there in itself, what learning can we take? What have we had to put in place? What's worked? What hasn't worked? Um, so I think we can actually probably theme some of those conversations as well. But it's, it's not just LRS that want to be sort of leading on this. We see this um, wellbeing network as all of us being involved. So it, it's very much not LRS wanting to do this. It, it's all of us in it together, um, I guess. So it's going to rely on input um, from everyone really. Um, that would would like to get involved. So we'll make sure that those that those details of those reflection sessions um, come out to you. Um, also, uh, I'd urge you to have a look at the LRS Conference Hub webpage, where you'll find a whole host of uh, resources. All the case studies that we've heard throughout the past month will be on there. 
as will all the webinars. Um, all of them have been recorded, so you'll be able to go back and, and listen to those if you wish. Um, so that kind of really um, closes today's session, I guess. Um, but just to say that if anyone has got any further comments, thoughts, ideas, suggestions, please get in touch. Um, and then we, we can certainly uh, take those suggestions forward. We can have discussions um, at those reflection sessions. Just to let you know that there's lots of discussions taking place actually. Um, I sit on a task and finish group. Uh, mental health and wellbeing is high on the agenda there, as it is with our chief leisure officers. So those conversations are taking part but or taking place rather but it's how do we bring everything together and a comment that you made Hannah earlier was about being consistent in our messaging um you know that that's really crucial and we we can't kind of pigeonhole people it's, it's being consistent to make sure that we have the right messaging there and um and the right sort of support in place for deliverers and for facilitators but also for participants too so i'd just like to thank everybody uh, for their input this afternoon I, I do apologize we have run over a little bit but i just i didn't want to break up those conversations and and the feedback because it was all so interesting and really valid um to how we actually move forward but Thank you for all attending, um, especially thank you um, to, to all those that have provided the case studies and uh, helped to facilitate those discussions this afternoon. Um, you will be sent an evaluation link for this um, webinar in the next few days, so please let us have the feedback. Um, doing everything virtual has been quite new to us and so there's a lot of learning from just sort of organising this conference um, anyway. So any thoughts, uh, please just feed those back. And um, my final comment really is we, we've been talking about mental wellbeing and, and how we um, make sure that we're looking after everybody else. But do you take time to take care of your, yourselves too. That, that, that's really important. So thank you once again. And please get in touch with any comments. And we'll now close the session. So thank you all very much. Bye. <laughs>